What's that, Dan? Like, get it going? Okay. Good morning. Happy Sunday. Welcome to Calvary Chapel, Roseville. Hey, Ed. Waving hi. Glad you guys are here and that you didn't put the Super Bowl preview stuff first. <laughs> you put God first. Yes. So why don't we get started? Oceans roaring out your praise. All creation glorifies your name. The angels bow before your throne. The heavens shine for you alone. All creation glorifies your name. All creation glorifies your name, singing holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, worthy, all the earth is filled with your glory. All creation glorifies your name, singing holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, worthy, all the earth is filled with your glory.
could fathom such boundless grace. The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe out of the side. Jesus, yours is the victory. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free, hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me, you have broken every chain, there's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope, Jesus Christ, my living Jesus. Why don't you take this time to say hello to someone? See if maybe there's someone you haven't met yet.
Good morning. Nope. Good morning. Good morning. Calvary Chapel, Roseville. How are you? Marvelous. That's a good word for this morning. That's perfect, actually. So, <coughs> we will go through some of these announcements. It's good to see people here on a Super Bowl Sunday. Yes, it uh, doesn't quite work for an excuse, at least in my book, because the game is until, what, three or four? Come on, people, you know, but whatever. And I per personally despise both teams, so it really doesn't mean anything to me, so... It's, it's, a rough, it's, it's a rough year for me, but moving on to more important things, we have Bible studies throughout the week. If you're not involved, consider jumping in on one. Uh, the men are in Ezekiel 23 and 24. We meet Tuesday evenings, 7 p.m. or 6.30, right, Dan, if you want to uh, fellowship before. So that's Tuesday evenings. Ladies meeting Thursday mornings, including this Thursday morning, do you know? Okay. Uh, for the book of Jonah, and then uh, the Bible bus meets on Wednesdays, uh, 7 p.m., and child care is provided for that. So, plenty of Bible studies to get into. Uh, we have a few needs. If you're looking to serve uh, in some way uh, as a ministry, we need nursery helpers um, to cycle in, hopefully just a once-a-month kind of thing. Uh, so nursery helpers, and also we are still looking for a person who can uh, contribute some time to clean the carpets. So if, if you cannot, maybe you know somebody else who would be willing to do that. Once again, it's these uh, things that uh, are chances for ministry. You know, believe it or not, cleaning carpets does count in heaven. Does it not? It does. So all this stuff is, is a wonderful thing. So opportunity there. Uh, we have men's breakfast this Saturday, right, Ray? Got it. Breakfast burritos. Nice. Sign up. Breakfast burritos this Saturday here at the church, 8 a.m. 8 a.m. So uh, let's see. I think that's about it, actually. If we can have the ushers come forward for this morning's offering. Looks like Hansi is coming in April, so that's good to put on your calendar. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this morning. It is a blessed thing to come into your house, to lay aside the things of the world, uh, the things that are frivolous, and then the things that are weighty, because we know that you deserve all the attention and you are intimately acquainted with our doings and our thoughts and our feelings and everything that's going on in our lives uh, we thank you for this. Bless your tithes and offering. Use them for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. All right. Let's turn to Psalm 17. And we're, I'm actually going to read uh, verses 6 through the end of the uh, psalm through 15. Uh, cause I, so, anyways, it's going to say... Psalm 17, I have called upon you, for you will hear me, O God. Incline your ear to me and hear my speech. Show your marvelous loving kindness by your right hand. O you who save those who trust in you, from those who rise up against them, keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me under the shadow of your wings from the wicked who oppress me from my deadly enemies who surround me. They have closed up their fat hearts with the mouths they speak proudly. They have now surrounded us in our steps. They have set their eyes crouching down in the earth as a lion is eager to tear his prey and like a young lion lurking in his secret places. Arise, O Lord, confront him. Cast him down. Deliver my life from the wicked with your sword. With your hand from men, O Lord, from men of the world who have their portion in this life, whose belly you filled with the hidden treasure, they are satisfied with children and leave the rest of their possession in their babes. As for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I wake in your likeness. Amen. I ask you, are you a heavenly person or are you an earthbound person? Are you ready to see the Lord face to face? Amen. We're laying up treasures in heaven. 
God bless you.
longer breathing Dust that form the watching crown Takes the blood of Jesus Feel the earth is shaking now See the veil is split in two And he stood before the wrath of God Shielding sinners with his blood See the empty tomb today could not contain him once the servant of the world now in victory reigning lift your voices to the one who is seated on the throne see him in the Jerusalem, praise the one who saved us. Lift your voices to the one who is seated on the throne. See him in the new Jerusalem, praise the one who saved us. Like 
Father, it is true that it is their direct correlation. We say we want to know you more, and yet uh, we don't want to give things up. We want to know you more. We want to know you more, but it involves us surrendering more of ourself. Uh, and this has been a problem since Genesis 3. But you have made it possible. You have made it You've made a way so that we can commune with you, if we choose, every single day we walk on this earth. We thank you for this. Bless this time. Bless your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. For blessing her. Thank you for blessing us, the Lord. Thank you. And the people that the Lord uses. Praise God. Let's pray. Lord, this morning we're here and we're blessed and we're looking for the biggest, best blessing ever from you. And that's the word of God, Lord. And here we go through the word of God. Word for word, verse for verse, chapter, book. Move on to another book, Lord. That's how we do it. And Father, we just have to touch every aspect of life. We can't just tell all the fun stuff. We have to tell the stuff that's not fun. And Father God, uh, that's a big task, Lord. And we thank you, Jesus. I come humbly before you with this passage that we have. And Lord, it's about the biggest, best blessing. And Father, we thank you so much for blessing us and how you spare us, Lord, what we deserve and you give us so much mercy and grace, Lord. And Father God, we thank you also for justice because justice is part of who you are. We thank you in your name, Jesus. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, people. This morning, let's prayerfully, using the five Ps, let's apply scripture to all areas of our lives so we can be blessed with the biggest, best blessings. Now, what are the five Ps? Oh, that's right, I never told you that. 
<laughs> oh, man. Okay, number one. Pause. We paused in prayer. Number two. Ponder. We ponder as we go through the Scriptures. We ponder. We look. We think. We wonder. We say, hey, what's this about? We ponder it. Number three. The passage. We ponder the passage that we're in. We dig into it. We dig out the nuggets in it. And we look at them. And then number four, then we leave here and we practice what we've learned in the Word of God, from the Word of God. And number five, and probably most important of all, because otherwise it's nothing but intellectual knowledge, head knowledge, and may not even get to the heart, because that distance between the head and the heart is vast. It's vast. There's so much, so many who have head knowledge, but there's no heart. And so number five, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? We practice in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now this morning, are you ready for the biggest, best blessing? And God is ready to deliver it at all times, not just this morning, but God wants it for us in every area of our life in our finances, in our marriage, in our, with our children, with our grandchildren, in our singleness, whatever God wants to bless. Amen? And we see the nation of Israel going through their cycles where they're worshiping the Lord and they're paying attention, they're acknowledging the blessings and whatnot, and then they distract, and then they drift and they fall away. And then the Lord says, hey, i got to get your attention again, kids. I love you. I want to fellowship with you. I want you to be my children. I want to have a relationship. I want to play with you guys. I want to enjoy you guys. I want to share the wisdom with you guys. But, you know, you're off in the wrong playground. You're off in the rival gang territory. And I need to pull you back. And so he gets our attention in many different ways. Amen? And some of those ways, you know, the more that we ignore, those ways become more and more intense and more and more troublesome with more and more consequences until finally we're, we're on, our, on, our, on our knees. I'm the pastor of the Calvary Chapel Pastors List Server. This past week, we're, we're all reading the pastors, the Calvary Chapel pastors, and one of the pastors tells us his testimony. And he says, I was driving in my car. No, no, I'm sorry. He, he, was, he had been in his car, but then he rented his car out for $40 for a day. Actually, it was more like for a night to someone. And he wasn't sure if that car would even come back because of the community that he was traveling in. And he, he was a speed freak, the pastor wasn't a pastor then. This is B.C., before he became a Christian. And he's, life is a total train wreck. And he's, then he's, the Lord spoke to him, and the Lord said, hey, you know, you got to, this is not good. This is, you know, you, don't, you just rented your car out for $40 to get some crack or crank or whatever it is. And, you know, you, your life's a mess. And he found himself in rival gang territory. Because he was in a gang. He had gang affiliation. And it's at night. He's walking because his car's been rented out for 40 bucks. And he's walking and he realizes, I'm in rival gang territory. And then he joined God's gang. Gave his life to Jesus. I felt like writing back and, and saying, how long ago was this? <laughs> but that, you know, I, I just, you know, I... I Sometimes I'll do that on the list server, and I'll say, oh, man, the guys, you know, they're probably saying, you know. Like one time I jokingly said that, that our elders arrive in a limousine to church on Sunday, and, man, did I get slammed. You know, my sense of humor doesn't always transfer to other people. And when I'm in England, it does. The English always understand my jokes, but Americans, not so much. But we left off last week in Joel chapter 2, verse 17, with the prophet Joel declaring, heralding a message from God Almighty to the people of Israel. And that message started out 
with verse 17. Left, uh, ended, actually, we left off with verse 17. And Joel is telling the people this. He's saying, and he's talking to the priests, let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Because Israel is in such a, a, a state of dis- decay, such a, a state of apostasy and drifting away from the Lord that now the priests are called who minister to the Lord. Weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people. He calls up upon the priest to say, to go before God. But this message is from God, given to Joel from God. And so God is saying to, to, to Joel to tell the people, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach that the nations should rule over them. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Terrible. Why? Do you ever feel like asking, where is God in this situation in my life? Where is God in my life with all these things that are going on in my family, in my children's lives, in the world? All the things that are going on out there, this, this virus, 304 deaths in China. Of course, like 60,000 people die in our country from the flu every year. But, you know, this has potential to be a world epidemic. That's why last week, WHO, the World Health Organization, declared it a, a, a world emergency. Because who knows? We have vaccines for the flu. We have even things you can take when you first feel it coming on to help you through it. But for this deal, there's nothing. They're trying to find something. And then you have the Palestinian uh, group, who the the Palestinian Authority, who the leader of, has has decided that cut off, they've cut off all communications with with Israel and the United States, including They are no longer taking any responsibility for security on the West Bank where they had been been cooperating and trying to keep things from blowing up on the West Bank, trying to keep it under control. They're they're just saying no. They won't take phone calls from President Trump. They won't read emails from President Trump. They say, nope, that's it. We, We want nothing to do with this initiative that the President of the United States has just offered. We're just... That's it, we're out of the game. So all these different things that are happening. But we know the Word of God tells us that we have the 2020, the year 2020 vision, where we can see, we can read the book of Revelation, we can read Ezekiel. We know what's going to happen, amen? And it's going to be good in the end. And the entire nation in Joel's time wondered, When is the blessing coming? What about our mess-ups in the past? And we can wonder, we can say, man, I messed up raising my kids. I messed up my marriage. I messed up this and that. I messed up the finances. I messed up my health by living unhealthy, smoking cigarettes, and now my lungs are gone, and all kinds of different things. Didn't get enough exercise. Ate Kentucky Fried Chicken every night. And I didn't have the grilled chicken. It was the deep fried. And now I've got clogged arteries. And so what's going to happen? Well, sooner or later, you're going to pass on and be with the Lord. That's what's going to happen, no matter how, if you ate vegetables your whole life. And no meat or anything, no cholesterol. Well, that'll be good when you get to be with the Lord. We don't like the transition. I, I don't look forward to the transition much unless it's quick, but, um, you know, (laughs) I look forward to getting there. Amen? Amen. But the entire nation of Israel is on their knees because the locusts have come and eaten all the green, all the crops, all the harvest, everything. And now they're going to be in a famine because God sent the locusts. And we saw that last week. Now, Joel with supernatural warp speed. Joel takes us from the original ancient date of the prophecy to the very end of this present age. 
to the day of the Lord, the end times, the final deal where the Lord decides justice must be met out upon the nations of the earth and my people must be blessed to the time when the day of the Lord will be fully fulfilled by the return of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who will destroy all godless usurpers and will rule and reign over planet Earth. Finally, the lamb and the lion will be together peacefully. Oh, there'll be no tears, all kinds of wonderful things. The things that we yearn for within us, the things that we fight, those viruses, the cancers, the... The, the, the broken relationships, the, the, the feelings of, of insecurity, all these things that we hate because we know that they were never meant to be because in the Garden of Eden they were not there until the fall of man. And this passage is not only for the future, but for our present as well. It shows us how God works and that God always wants to bless his chosen children. And how are we chosen? Because we choose him. And then once we choose him, we are chosen. He doesn't go around saying, oh, I cho cho chose this one and then that one. No, I don't like that one. They're of the wrong nationality or gender or color, you know, whatever. No, that's not how it works. No, he gives everyone the opportunity. In Joel chapter 2, verse 18, then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. You see, the Lord always pities his people. Because when you come right down to it, you may think you're grand. But that's a, a delusion. Because actually, when you come right down to it, we're all pretty pitiful when you come right down to it. But that's okay. That's the human condition. Sometimes we're incredible. Other times, like Hitler's Germany, we are just pitiful as can be. A whole nation against a whole nation turn evil. We in this country have turned our eyes away. Then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. The Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, behold, I will send you grain. Now don't forget, they, they're in famine time. They don't know what's going to happen. Behold, Strong word, I will send you grain and new wine and oil and you will be satisfied, you'll be satiated by them. I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations. Look at that pitiful nation of Israel. Man, they are messed up and they're declaring that their God, Jehovah, is the, the God. Well, man, maybe we don't want the God because our God of Balaam and of our, our false gods are... What they're saying are false gods. We're doing better than they are. Well, God's not going to leave them there. Maybe for you, there may be people out there who don't believe. And they look at you and they say, man, you know, if you're a Christian and, and that's what Christianity brings, well, I, I think I'll stay away for forever. Like one gal in our church who, who her father said, well, you know what? You're all Christians in this family, but if, you're, if that's what Christianity is about and the likes of you, well, I'd rather go to hell. Not good, but, you know, the family was messed up. But they, were, they loved the Lord. And so it, just because things don't look good on the surface, just because things aren't working your way necessarily, doesn't mean that, that the Lord has left you behind. Then the Lord will be zealous for his land. And behold, I will send you. Behold, and will draw but I will remove far from you the northern army. And there's all kinds of northern armies in our lives. In this case, it's a northern army in the future, Revelation tells us, and Ezekiel tells us. And we'll drive him, and Joel tells us, and we'll drive him away into a barren and desolate land. But we can apply this to any enemy in our life. With his face toward the eastern sea and his back towards the western sea, his stench will come up and his foul odor will rise because he has done monstrous things. Monstrous things to God's people. Monstrous. Terrible. Terrible things. Terrible, terrible things. 
And then verse 19, do we do, do verse 19, Daniel? Okay. Then verse 21. But I will remove far... Oh, verse 21. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done marvelous things. They've done monstrous things. The Lord has done marvelous things. Can we move forward here? Do not be afraid, you beasts of the field. And he's talking to the beasts of the field. For the open pastures are springing up, and the tree bears its fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their strength because the animals are hurting, because there's no grain, there's no feed for them. The land is just parched. The land has been totally destroyed by the locusts that swarmed in the earlier chapter. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you. The former rain and the latter rain in the first month. The threshing floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. So I will restore you to the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you. He sent that army of locusts. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be put to shame. My people shall never be put to shame. We do shameful things, the Crusades, different things throughout Christian history. Some were shameful. But in the end, we will not be shamed. In our passage, Joel takes us to the future prophecy of Ezekiel 38, verses 15 through 17. Then you will come from your place out of the far north, talking to the armies of the north. We... We, we see these as Russia coming against Israel and, and the nations of the earth. And you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on the horses, a great company and a mighty army. You will come up against my people, Israel, like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I am hollowed in you, O Gog, before their eyes. Thus says the Lord God, Are you he of whom I have spoken in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied for years in those days that I would bring you against them? These, this is talking about Joel. It's talking about e Ezekiel. In the end times, they'll be looking and they'll look back upon those prophets way back when. And then Ezekiel 38, verses 5 through 6. You shall fall on the open field. These are the armies that come against Israel in the last days. For I have spoken, says the Lord God. And I will send fire on Magog and on those who live in security in the coastlands. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. Yeah, I guess so. God sends fire down on you. You know and back to Joel verse 18, Joel 2 verse 18, then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. The word then marks a development in the chain of events. In prophetic passages, whenever you see the word then, especially at the beginning of a sentence, beginning of a scripture, pay attention. Pay attention. Because the Holy Spirit is clearly laying out a pattern of a sequence of events. If you miss the then, well then, pun intended, you could just end up missing the meaning of the whole prophecy. So always pause, remember pause, one of the five Ps, when you encounter a then, especially at the beginning of a sentence. Here, then means in the future, then. 
And so from Joel chapter 2, verse 18, and then we'll, as we go into chapter 3 in a couple of weeks, Joel describes the restoration of the nation Israel, the best blessings, the biggest best blessings that will come upon them as everything turns. Joel describes the restoration, moving from the previous depictions of judgment that we've been going through. And I'm glad, I hate, I hate, not, not hate, but I, I don't enjoy going through the judgments as, lo, as well, much as I enjoy going through the blessings when I'm teaching. And that's if I were doing topical messages, I probably would tend to, to stand, stay away from the judgments. But because we are Calvary Chapel, and we go through the whole world, word of God, the full counsel of God. You know, I did the judgments, but I'm really happy now that we're coming into restoration and blessings. It so, flows so much better for me. It's so much easier for me. Now, beginning with number one on our fill-in, Number one on, our, on your fill-ins. He spares his people. He spares his people in spite of who we are. And sometimes God uses us because of who we are. But oftentimes he uses us in spite of who we are. But if we make ourselves available, he always uses us. God spares his people. Scripture says, and pity, he pities his people. And it describes the Lord's compassion on his people, thus sparing them total destruction because the nation of Israel actually could just be totally destroyed. The nation of America at this point could be totally destroyed. But Scripture says he will have pity. The Hebrew word is chanel. And it describes the Lord's pity and compassion on his people, sparing them from destruction, from total destruction. It implies this Hebrew word, actually it's chamel, implies that because the chosen people deserved judgment, God tells the priests, tells Joel, God tells Joel, Joel tells the priests to plead for the people, to plead mercy hey, they know not what they do. Plead mercy. Plead mercy. The exact same action word is used twice in another prophecy in Malachi chapter 3, verses 17 through 18, where God says he will spare his people in that day. They shall be mine. Uppercase M, God's, says the Lord of hosts. On that day, on the day that I make them my jewels. And this is speaking of Israel, but also of the Gentiles who have turned their lives over to God. And I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. The son can do some wrong, can do a lot of wrong, but the Lord spares the son. And then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve God. You're in one gang or the other gang, people. You're either in the gang that serves God or you're in the gang that doesn't serve God. Amen? It's black and white. People don't like that. Oh, you know, that, that's not right. Well, it's your choice. God's a gentleman. He doesn't force it on anyone. He doesn't make you be in one gang or the other. In Joel's time, words meant different things than they mean in this time. And in Joel 2, verse 19, the Lord will answer and say to his people, he'll answer the priests and say to his people, behold, behold, feast your eyes on this. See, the word behold has lost its, lost its original meaning. The original thing was back in Joel's day when the word said, when a prophet said, when an angel said, when, a, when God said, Behold, man, you, what, what, what's this going to be? Whoa, I, you know, it's almost like impossible to, to, for me to give you an example of the str strength of that word in this time. It'd be like if you walked into a friend's house and they took you to a, a back room and, and or down to the basement and they said, Behold, 
what I have for you. And you look and there's this big treasure chest that's full of gold doubloons. And they, what was, those fakers? No, they're real. They're authentic. But they're for you. And behold, <laughs> whoa, behold. Or you have some terrible disease and someone says to you, come and, and, and we're, we're going to pray for you. And behold, God is telling us you're going to get a healing. And everyone's heard. Everyone agrees. Yeah, God's going to do this. It's, 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 we've, people have been coming from different places. One person saying something that God said, it doesn't mean all that much. But when you've got three, four, five coming and saying, God said this, then you t start taking heed. Because see, God first tells me. But telling me, well, that could be for me. Or I could, you know, it could not be. But then confirmation is when God, like when God called me to the ministry. And then, you know, who was I? I was nobody. I was, I mean, like my, you know, like a lawyer I knew told me, oh, no, Ken, God, people like you, no, you can't be a minister. No, you got this past that's just too trashed. And, you know, he was a Presbyterian. And he says, no. And in the Presbyterian denomination, probably not, you know, and, and whatnot. But then other people came and said, hey, you know what, Ken, you should be in the ministry. Well, there was confirmation. And then, so I had put the flag out. I had said, yeah, you know, I, I believe that I'm, I'm to be in the ministry. Then others confirmed it. And then the next thing, it happened. And people were blown away. That was, you know, 35 plus years ago. Behold, feast your eyes on this. Whenever you see behold in Scripture, think of it as an ancient electronic billboard, gigantic, flashing, drawing you, drawing people to the, to the delights, the blessings, the best blessings ever that are there for you. You remember that, when you see that word behold, when you're reading Scripture. Now, 19b, that's the second part of verse 19. New American Standard, do we have New American Standard? I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations. That's New King James. Now, New American Standard reads, and sometimes New American Standard has better translation, other times it doesn't, than King James or some of the other translations. There's like 30 different translations. I have them all so I can compare them. Now, New American Standard, which I used to use here, but then we switched to New King James because Chuck Smith used New King James and, and, and Calvary's by far mostly used New King James. But in the New American Standard, it says, and I will never again make you a reproach among the nations. Instead of I will no longer, it reads, I will never again. Now, New American Standard has the advantage of more manuscripts, ancient manuscripts, whether it be Hebrew manuscripts or Greek manuscripts, to put into the computer that they didn't have in King James Day, or even the ability 80 years ago, and then it all goes in there and the algorithms and all this work on it, and then you, you get what the human mind could take a lifetime to come up with. You get the, the, the best translation, grammatical translation, the best uh, version, the best uh, explanation of it. And so, and I will never again make you a reproach again, again among the nations. Now, note the important time phrase, never again. Does that remind you of anything with Israel? Never again? The Holocaust. After the Holocaust, the people of Israel had a slogan, never again. The world had a slogan, never again will we allow something like this to happen. Never again. We let it go on for too long before we intervene, the United States and other countries, Europe, and never again will people be genocided. Well, unfortunately, go to Darfur, Sudan, and go to other places. Well, it happened again. But here, it I will never again make you a reproach. Important phrase. This has not happened. This has not come to being yet. 
The people of Israel, this was written a couple thousand plus years ago, the people of Israel have continuously been a reproach to the nations of the world, including Hitler and what took place there. In the history of the Jewish people, among the nations, for centuries a reproach. But this is a promise that will be filled in the future when the Lord restores Israel to the land and Messiah Jesus comes and rules as king. Hitler proved the never again in this prophecy has to be in the future. Number two on your fill-in. Sin has an evil stench. Sin has an evil stench. Uh, those words, sin, stench. They, man, they, they really are good words to put together, aren't they? In verse 20, But I'll remove far from you the northern army, and then down, right there, his stench will come up and his foul odor will rise because he has done monstrous things. Attention is given to the Hebrew word, biosh, foul odor, stench of the dead. In Ezekiel, the prophecy continues on, saying, Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 12, for seven months, Seven months is a long time. The house of Israel, the nation of Israel, will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. Who? Burying who? The armies from the north who come against them. They defeat. God defeats the armies of the north. There's millions of dead. It takes them seven months to bury them. Why do you have to bury them? They stink. Rotting corpse stink. Amen? And so these are the prophecies of what will happen. The Lord has spoken of, of some terrifying and fearful things which will happen in the future. People, it is never good to be an enemy of God. Amen? It is never good to be an enemy of God. And who does God say is an enemy of God? Those who don't accept Christ, number one, broad stroke, enemies of God. But even when we sin, we put ourselves in a position where we need to be careful that you know, we're never going to be the enemy of God because we're the children of God. But still, we, we, you know, we go against God. In spite of the mistakes of the past, we see in Joel 21, the biggest, best blessing is on the way. And this is, can be applied to us in the present. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done marvelous things. Like being born again is a marvelous thing. For sure. Joel says there will be fullness instead of emptiness. There will be fullness instead of famine. Right now, in Joel's day, they are in the middle of a famine for beasts and humans. There, but what's coming will be excess instead of emptiness. Actually, excess. More than they had before the locust came. In the future, in the end times, more than they had before the armies from the north came. After the, the, the defeat of the enemy. Verses 22 through 23... Do not be afraid, you beasts of the field, for the open pastures are springing up. Don't worry, there's going to be food. You're not going to starve, again, uh, starve to death. And the tree bears its fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their strength. Be glad then, you children of Zion. We are children of Zion. And rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you. The former rain and the latter rain in the first month. Now this was to them at that time, they could relate to this like no man's business. Uh, it'd be like us relating to driving a car. How many of you cannot relate to driving a car? No one. Well, that, this, 
They were a, an agrarian society, and everything was about farming for the most part. And, they, and the rain, the rain was a miracle when it came at the right time in their mindset. God, it's, God sent the rain. If the rain didn't come, it's because God wouldn't let it come. That's how it worked. But we're to rejoice and be glad in it for the same reasons. God's power, God's provision, and God's promises. For he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you. The former rain and the latter rain in the first month. Next point on your fill-in. Sin, okay, as an evil stretch. Number three, Lord, rain on me. Rain on me, Lord. I remember I was in the Bahamas. We had sailed from Puerto Rico to Miami. We were about halfway through on the trip, and we had been out to sea for five days, and the salt water had gotten into our clothing, and, and even when, it, when, it, when it's r- raining or whatever, you know, your, your cl- clothes are all salty feeling. But even when the sun came out and and, and you thought it was dry, you still had that salty feeling. And we got to an island and got out and went on shore. This was B.C. days, heading for the bar. And what happens? It starts to downpour. And the captain and his son and myself, we're out in the outside of the bar and we're out there and we're, oh yeah, rain on me getting soaked, getting drenched, and guys are coming out of the bar, and they're looking, and they're going, what, is this guy, what are these guys do, fools doing? Well, we were getting that salt off of us. We were getting the blessing of that rain, of that sweet water, we called it. Sweet water, not salt water. Well, you see, the Word of God tells us that it rains on, huh? Who does it rain on? the righteous and the unrighteous. But in that day, when it rained on you, that was good. When it rained, it was a blessing. Always. It was wonderful. Rain, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, rain falls on the good and rain falls on the just and the unjust. The early rain in Israel in the farming season comes in October and November, and it lasts until as late as January or February, or it can come as late as January or February. It was for the germination of the grain. It germinated it, got it going. If it didn't come, the grain wouldn't be there full grown for harvest. And the early rain doesn't come suddenly, but by degrees so that the farmer can sow his wheat and then he can sow his barley. He can stagger the the crops as he plants. The much lighter latter rains in March and April are for the maturing of the grain. 1 Samuel 12, 16 through 18, rain and harvest was regarded as a miracle. Now therefore stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Is today not the wheat harvest? I will call to the Lord and he will send thunder and rain that you may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord and asking a king for yourselves. So Samuel called to the Lord and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. Now this was rain on the people because it was the wrong time of year. And so it ruined things. It ruined things. The grapes in Sonoma Valley, what happens if the rain comes too early? Mold, mold. And then the whole grape harvest, the wine harvest at Sonoma Valley, the farmers lose millions, if not billions of dollars because the mold gets the grapes. Just two weeks early, that's all it takes. Two weeks. Rain and harvest, at the right time, regarded as a miracle. Wrong time as judgment. Verse 24 says, The threshing floor shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. New wine and oil. Overflowing. Overflowing. They can't see it. They're saying, hey, how's that going to happen? But it will happen. Do we have verse 25? 
So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you. God sent that army. Of course, God's people experience sorrow and loss, but they also experience the biggest, best blessing of all, restoration and blessing. In the end, that which is gained far outweighs that which is lost. Isaiah 40 Verse 1, God does not allow the year of, years of suffering go unrewarded. After punishment comes restoration. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you. Revelation 7:17. 7, in the end, God will eat, wipe all our tears clean. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them, lead them to living fountains of water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Every tear, no tears in heaven. How many years of our lives have been consumed by the locust? How many years has self in one form or another robbed us of our golden sheaves, of our Biggest, best blessings, reducing them to dust. Man, my only biggest regret, my biggest regret, in not my only, my biggest regret in life is that I didn't become a Christian when I had the chance when I was like 17 years old. And the young life people were taking me surfing, my, my friend and I surfing on the coast of New Jersey and up to, on this island, island city, and... and and we're in the car, and they're, they're team challenge, and they're witnessing to us, and, and we're just looking at each other. And say, okay. And, and Tita, my friend, she's telling me, because I'm kind of getting irritated, she's going, don't, we get to go surfing. They'll buy us lunch, too. And I'm, oh, okay. You know, she goes, just, you know, pretend you're listening. So that's what I did. Self-indulgence frivolity, meaningless wasting of time and talent and opportunity, sloth and lethargy, mixed in, mixed in evil motives in our lives, secret sins, weapons formed against us that play a part of the locust, the wood beetle, and the sinner worm devouring the produce of our lives. But God wants to forgive, and he does. He puts it away in his mind. He forgets it as far as the east is from the west, the word of God tells us. Amen? God is zealous. He's jealous. That word means, jealous means zealous. Zealous means jealous to give us as large a result as possible for our life's work. And Paul, I'm sure, had a testimony of his B.C. days that, brought a harvest to the people back in that day, as it still does to this day. Verse 26, Then you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be put to shame. Never be put to shame. No shame, number four, on the fill-in. Lord, rain on me, number four. No shame for my people. No shame for my people. Amen? Verse 27. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. Let's remember this, people. Let's know this. Let's own this. Because so often, the word shame in the Hebrew means to turn red, to be embarrassed, to be humiliated. It's a, a, a word that every single person on earth has experienced, and we don't like it. It's a bad experience. Amen? When you get caught doing something wrong, or you didn't do what you should have done, and you realize it, then there's the shame. Well, God takes the shame. God doesn't leave us in shame. That's the way he works. That's the way he is. He loves us. Now Spurgeon said that it's not that God comes and takes the years that the locust ate in your life and devoured and destroyed in your life and then gives those years back. Because why? Those years are gone. 
their history, they're in the past. You can't get them back. But what you can get back is the fruit. The vine. You can get the grape back that you missed out on. Because then when you become a Christian, God just blesses you. And He restores and He gives to you. And you end up jumping. It's like you're moving along here and and then you know you do things and you're down here and then you actually you get up a little bit but then you're down again and you're moving along in life and 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 it's not pretty it's not great and then you become born again and then all of a sudden you start seeing things God's way and you get up here now it's not that we are elite there's no such thing as super christians how many of you have ever heard of the latter rain movement the latter rain movement how many the latter rain movement? Oh man, maybe I should just not even talk about it then. The only Chris, you haven't heard of the latter rain movement? No? Or the former rain, huh? Okay, well the latter rain movement is gigantic. There's guys like Paul Kane and Oral Roberts was one of the first. And what happened back in 1945, there was revival and, and it was attributed to this, this latter rain deal where they said, oh, this is the latter rain. And then throughout the Gainsborough movement and uh, different ones that has been in the recent history in the 80s and the 90s, uh, the Pensacola blessing, the Pensacola revival, and all these different revivals that were attributed to latter rain movement. But then along with it came some craziness and some aberrant teaching and whatnot. And the latter rain movement is still here today, and, and that whole group of Christians attributes um, any revival that comes along pretty much to, to the latter rain, where God now is pouring the latter rain upon us. And out of that came the shepherding movement and, and just a, a host of, of, of movements uh, that were on one, the balance beam. Some of, them, some of the things were really good, but other things were really bad. And so it was hard to tell. And once again, you know, God uses us in spite of us. And so the, the latter rain movement. Um, and so that's just a part of, of church history, of more recent church history since 1945 on. Uh, the original guy who, who, start, who first said God called him and, and that it was the latter rain movement, he, um, he died in a car accident. And um, he... he, he was esteemed by his followers. And then he had taught Oral Roberts, and so Oral Roberts came out of that. And uh, we know it. How many have heard of Oral Roberts? Okay, a lot more. And that's where things picked up, and then they kept moving. Up in, up in uh, Reading, there's uh, Bethel. Bethel would say, well, we're latter rain, the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, because rain is like a symbol for the Holy Spirit pouring upon us water of blessing. And so just a little trivia. Uh, let's pray. We're going to have communion. Lord, we come before you and we lift up your word to you and we thank you, just as Spurgeon described, that yes, those years are gone, but you restore, Lord. Israel had to go through what it went through. And Father God, you didn't give them, take them back in history and reset the clock. But what you did was you actually blessed them more than they ever expected. And Peter, on the day of Pentecost, he, he didn't deserve what he got, Lord, the filling of the Holy Spirit, the dwelling of the Holy Spirit within, within him. And Paul, he certainly didn't. Paul, after persecuting Christians, then he ends up being the brain of the church. And Father God, um, on and on and on, all the people in history who didn't deserve what they got, but you restored not the years that they had lost but not peter at the uh, in the garden of gethsemane or peter um just doing his things whether it be cutting off an ear or denying you lord three times uh, father not the not didn't get that stuff back didn't get that time back and erased but he did get the blessing of being peter throughout history and father incredible things and father god so too we even though those years that we destroyed and, and drifted and whatnot in our lives, some didn't, some never did. But Lord God, for those that did, we get them back. And for those that didn't, 
blessed as well. And Lord, we come before you on this communion Sunday and we lift up the communion, Lord. We ask a blessing upon it. These elements, we know they're just symbols. This is bread. It's not actually the body of Christ. This is grape juice. It's not the blood of Christ. But we use these because you gave the example, Lord. And we know that they represent something that we can only say, behold, behold. And in some Christian circles, they lift up the elements and they say, behold, the body of Christ, the blood of Christ. But yet, even though it's bread, definitely, and grape juice, if we, when we take it into our body, when we absorb it, it certainly if we were to die and, and that our bodies were looked into, we, they wouldn't find a piece of flesh where the cracker went in, or they wouldn't find human blood or godly blood where the grape juice went in. They'd find juice and they'd find bread. But Lord, on the other hand, the balance beam, on the other hand, it has supernatural power of sort, a mystery of sort. That it's a command, and whenever we fulfill commands, obey commands of the Lord, we're blessed. And so we come on a Sunday, or actually any day of the week, we can take communion. People take communion every day of the week. And Lord, we just look for the biggest, best blessing, Lord, in our life. As we acknowledge you and what you did on the cross out there in live stream world, if you don't know Jesus, ask him into your life. Maybe you have some communion right now because you know we do this on the first Sunday of the month usually. And you've prepared some grape juice and some bread. If you haven't, next time, next month do it. So you can take communion with us and more importantly with the Lord. And we recognize, Jesus, that you commanded that we would do this in remembrance of what you've done for us. In the past, died on that cross. In the present, blessing us. And in the future, the biggest and best blessings of all are on the horizon. Behold, wondrous, miraculous, marvelous blessing. As we sang this morning, you are marvelous. And Lord, we just ask for forgiveness because you said that we need to go before the altar and ask for forgiveness for our sins, Lord. Lay them at the feet of the cross and let you wash us clean. That's what the blood does. It washes us as white as snow. And for God, we symbolically seek that as we partake of your body where you died on the cross for us for our sins. You were sinless, but you died for our sins that we could be forgiven because a sacrifice had to be made. In the Old Testament, they would lay their hands on a goat and send that goat out of the camp with the sins of the, of the, of the tribe, of the, of the people of Israel, out into the wilderness, cast out from the community. Well, when we take the bread, we symbolically recognize that that's what the cross did cross took our sins but didn't have to be done every year it was finished once and for all let's partake of the bread thank you Jesus thank you Lord God thank you for the miracle Thank you. Lord, we know that because we heard the word, we're blessed. That's what the Bible tells us, that it doesn't return void. That those words that come in to us, they, we, may, we may not even remember them, but they have a, a power of their own because the Holy Spirit inspired these guys who wrote the books of the Bible, just like Joel you gave him the message to tell the people. And God does spare us, and this is how he does it. And next week we're going to see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and how that connects to being spared. And so, Lord, we come before you and we partake of, 
of what you've given. Let's partake. Thank you, Jesus. And Lord, I don't begin to pretend to understand the, totally the supernatural aspect of what we've just done. I just have a little glimpse here on earth of what we just partook of. And I know it's good. As I said, I think last week, I, I haven't had a hangover in 40 years. And the reason I haven't is because up in Yuba City at the church, when I became a believer, I just loved coming to church and hugging people and fellowshipping with people. And I loved communion. And then one night I, I drank the better part of probably of a bottle of wine. And the next day I just felt horrid and went to church. And I didn't, people came up and wanted to hug me. And I just said, oh, no, don't touch me. Because I felt icky. And then when I had communion, it just was like meaningless. There wasn't the great joy that I had had every communion before, which hadn't been that many, maybe six, six months of it because I had only been a believer for a short time, maybe three months, I don't really remember, maybe it was two months. But then I said, no, I never want to feel like that again, that separation from God, that separation from communion, and haven't. And I thank you for that, Jesus. That there is something miraculous, something spectacular, something wondrous, something wondrous, something just incredible, marvelous, Lord, about what we've just done. And that's the Holy Spirit doing something within us. Thank you, Jesus. We pray, we thank you, and in Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord. Amen. All right, God bless. What is that? Huh? You missed number four?